right now. All right, Jake and Gino, welcome to the Real Estate Marathon podcast, gentlemen. Thanks for, uh, thanks for jumping on the call today. Thanks, Larry, Mike. We're ready to go. Excellent. It, it's Excellent. been a marathon today, Gino. This is like the 15th uh, you know, <laughs> time I've been on a Zoom call with you today. So let, let the marathon uh, roll, baby. Oh, yes. Excellent Love thing. Um, so you guys, we're going to talk a lot about, uh, obviously, I want to dive into the book that you guys launched a couple months ago. Um, and knowing your background, we're going to get deep into the real estate as well. Um, and uh, then I'd love to finish it off with kind of overviewing the, the umbrella of companies that you guys have created as well. But before we jump into there, can you guys give a quick background on who you are and how you got started and uh, kind of how, you, how your journey has progressed over the years? Sure. Uh, the pizza guy and the drug rep, we both met back in 2009. Jake was a pharmaceutical rep. He was catering lunches out of the restaurant and he was my brother's friend he wasn't even my friend and and to make insult to injury he had a dish named after himself at the restaurant and i didn't even have my own dish it was jake's <laughs> chicken right jake's chicken and i would prepare this jake's chicken every day and go who in god's name is this jake i don't even have my own dish but that's a story for another time right 2011 comes along i meet jake in 2009 Brother brings him into my into the kitchen, and I'm preparing the Jake's chicken for these catering orders. And I'm like, dude, nice to meet you. Just you know, let's keep in touch. I know you want real estate. I I know there's a common ground somewhere. I like Jake in the very beginning because he was very motivated. He was one of the only prepared W two employees that I'd ever seen in my entire life. I don't think he liked his job. I think he liked what he did. I think he liked the hunt. I think he liked to give value to the doctors. I think he liked the relationship aspect of it. So I think we bonded real quick. And, you know, we'd been doing it for a couple of years. In 2011, he comes into the restaurant and says, Gino, I'm leaving. I'm going to Knoxville in a couple of weeks. And I'm like, really? So let's sit down. When you get down there, let's look at real estate. But let's take out the laptop right now. Let's go on LoopNet and look at some of these deals. And when I saw the deals, I was like, this looks like a possibility. I said, you don't know much about real estate. I'm getting some education. When you get down there, let's start looking at some deals. And that's what we ended up doing. It took us 18 months. Jake moves down there without his wife. So he's down there for six months all by himself. So lonely. So lonely. <laughs> Long I bought time. cowboy boots. <laughs> <laughs> and he still got those cowboy boots. He's trying to give them to my son. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it was hard the first deal. I mean, it took really, literally took us 18 months from the time we started. His wife, his wife moves down. They end up buying a house, but we still have that desire to buy assets. We still have the desire to do something different because we're both doing something that we don't like. We're not sure of our futures. He's worried about layoffs. I'm worried about you know Uber, Grubhub, DoorDash, uh, all these meal meal prep places. I have Whole Foods making pizza, so I see my market share shrinking. Plus, the recession hit the restaurants pretty hard in that area as well. It did. I mean, and, and you know, that kind of food right now, you have fast food with Panera. I just saw the, I just saw the future and I said, I need to do something. I don't want to flip homes. I think Jake didn't want to do that either. We already have, you know, full-time jobs. Let's see if we can scale up and buy a couple of small apartment complexes together. Wow. Very nice. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to kind of jump into the honeybee. You guys had wrote mm -hmm. a book that's uh, it's a parable and it really kind of struck home with me because um, you know, you, you work your full-time job, you feel a little bit trapped. Um, what, how did the idea for the honeybee come to be? I mean, was that something that you, you felt because of your situations? Go ahead, Gina. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is what a great partnership does. Jake says, let's write a book. And I said, really? <laughs> And he said, yeah. I said, okay, we'll do it. And it was just one of those things like, hold on, tell the truth, man. I, I was begging for that one. <laughs> it's let's start another podcast. Let's start listen, another one. So. Listen, book writing is not cheap. Okay. <laughs> Anyone that tells you it's, it's cheap to write a book, they're, 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 you know, bootstrapping it in a way they probably should not. And they're going to put out crap. And, and that's one thing that, you know, I think Gina and I from the very beginning are just, you know, we want first class all the way. And so, you, you know, a lot of these things, and if you, you have the I'm a mentality, it's, it's going to, you know, probably put you in situations where you shouldn't be doing certain jobs or you're going to have to pay for it. And so look, I don't know how much we put behind the book. It's probably about 100K, but it was, it was well worth it at the end of the day. So Gina, sorry to interrupt. No, and I think the idea we wrote it was because we had seen our success and really documenting our success from a small little 25-unit property to owning you know, the first 1,000 units by ourselves without any syndication and then starting a syndication company and then starting a, a, a charitable arm of the business and, and looking back and saying that this is duplicatable by anyone if they have the framework. You can take this into the single family home space. You can take this into the food space. In any kind of business, you can really relate to it. And I think the principles aren't really, they're complex, but they're not really taught anywhere. 
And once you start small with one little stream and you focus on that stream and you become much better at that stream of revenue, like us with that 25 unit property, we really repositioned it. We did a great job. And, and I think the most important uh, aspect of it is we didn't go and start a restaurant. We, we stuck to the multifamily space. That's something that is very uh, important. We didn't go, if now, if you want to get into the restaurant space, maybe you own the building that houses the restaurant. That's complementary to multifamily, right? No, we started with the, with, with the investment, then the property management, then the education arm. So it's all teaching real estate, then the syndication arm. And then from there, we continue to expand those multiple streams, but really focusing on that one stream, getting really good at it, and then adding those multiple streams on. Yeah, it's the core. You focus on the core business and the the different, you know, uh, you know, businesses within a business that serve that business. And that's essentially what we built out. Uh, we started with the investment property, and we started, as you know, said the, the property management company because we didn't want anyone pulling the wool over our eyes. We wanted to be very clear on pricing and the business. And the only way to do that for us was to start from the ground up and build it as we went. And then it, and we got into the financing piece and then the syndication and the education uh, just introduced us to so many great people through media and, and just the events that we've done. It really opened our eyes to, you know, what things are without, you know, letting people take advantage because a lot of times when you get into a new space, there's you know, this, you know, especially in multifamily in, in, in markets that we're in, there's, you know, people say it's like an old boys club and it's hard to break through. And it took us 18 months to get into that first deal. So we wanted to have control over the entire process. And that's been the way we've developed the, you know, the family of companies. Nice. Cool. Yeah. So um, how did you guys come up with the honeybee analogy? Like, so as I read this book, like there's so many perfect analogies that teach these really basic, but so important, like business principles. You got the worker bee versus the, the hive um, or worker versus the hive owner. What did you think about the worker bee versus the hive? Let, let, I want to hear from you actually on that. What do you think about that? Oh, so that and with all these basic principles, how they kind of tied together with this B man and with, with, with Tom, I think this is one of these books that I will, will give anybody graduating high school because it teaches these principles in such an easy to understand way. And I love the, the honey, or sorry, the, the honey bee versus the, the hive owner was one of the best. And then the smoke was that other thing, right? You put the smoke to kind of confuse people and the analogy was the day-to-day -day lives, our world win, and can it not really think of, think of banking terminology by itself. I mean, that that's that's by intention. You know, if yeah. you go in and you start to really look at some of the higher level finance, it's it's by design. And so I think that was one of the keys. And, and if you look, I mean, the way that the society is set up in so many ways, we're chasing our tails because it's a lack of education. The school system doesn't serve us properly to become entrepreneurs and to grow. We're put in you know, to the position to come out and become worker bees. And at the end of the day, I think a lot of us want more and we want more control over our lives. And you're not going to get that in basic education. So this is, this is an alternative to what uh, we're being fed into you know, the public school system, if you will, and, and the colleges. And to yeah, piggyback off of what Jake says, I could give a perfect example of what, what kind of week I've had. I've had really a pretty amazing five or six days. We just did a two-day boot camp. We came home. I've been on multiple podcasts. I've been creating, I'm, I'm creating a Wheelbarrow Profits Youth Academy for the, uh, for, for the community. It's a lot of education, a lot of training videos, a lot of content. I'm creating a three elements of a pitch training academy for our group also. These are all tasks that I'm not going to see any revenue. I'm not going to see any, any benefits for the next six months to a year. And that's the problem when you're the honeybee hive owner. It may take you a while to make that honey, but you own that hive. And eventually, if you do the right thing, you commit and you figure it out, you will see profit. You will see gain from it. And that's why the honeybee is just used to that transactions. He's just, he's just used to getting paid. And it's very hard for an entrepreneur. With these multiple streams of revenue, I've been able to say, okay, I can defer not getting paid today. And I'll take a bigger pay cut, pay gain for tomorrow. And for me, that's been the biggest change in my life. When I was working at the restaurant, I was used to work for the week, get paid at the end of the week, and rinse and repeat. As an entrepreneur, you might get bumps and valleys and peaks and have weeks where you've had great weeks, but you have nothing to show for it other than some content you've created, but you know the greater good. And I always give the analogy of the farmer. It's very simple. You plant a seed. It may take you six months or a year to cultivate that seed, just like multifamily. So really, everyone out there who's thinking about being an entrepreneur, it's an amazing lifestyle, but there are some peaks and valleys, and there's not many of us to share that story. So that's why we think the honeybee, when you read the honeybee, you'll, you'll, you'll be able to connect. And if you're on that journey, on that process of being Noah, you can say to yourself, I can relate to Noah, and I want to be like Noah, and I want to implement these uh, lessons that we've learned in the story. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah it's that's... all about the long view too, guys. I mean, every business we've started in the beginning, it sucked. Meaning that it was, it was not profitable the way we wanted it to be. We got hit in the face. We got hit in the gut. It, you know, and it was just that belief in ourselves and taking the long view that we knew we were in the right vehicle, but it was on us to take 100% responsibility for all of our outcomes to make it happen. And that's one of our core values is to make it happen. And we talk about it even in the book because there's times where, look, the world is going to slap you around to see if you have what it takes to hang in there. And if you, most people quit, it's just as simple as that. I mean, it took us two years to find a deal. It took us, you know, probably it took me five years, but if I'm being honest, you know, uh, two years to get into it, three years, it took me five years before it really started seeing the fruits of my labor. And if you're going to tell somebody, Hey, you know, go do this, get your ass kicked for five years and see if it works. Most people are going to say, uh, yeah, sure. Or no, but eventually they're going to quit. But it's just that it's that peskiness that has allowed Gino and myself to, you know, create really good lives for ourselves and our families. And that's what it was all about. It was about control and, and really trying to create a life of abundance for the people in our inner circle. And and for me, it was it was very important with reading the book that when I, I really related to Noah, because, you know, he was sitting there on a daily basis and in his head, he was doing the, the resignation letter and, you know, and it just, I, I related to that kind of desperation where, you know, he was just unhappy with his situation. And luckily he was rescued by Tom in in multiple different ways. He and rescued himself. He got a little guidance, but he did, you know. he did. He got some guidance, but uh, you know, without, without that, that catalyst of, of meeting Tom, you know, it was one of those things. And, and uh, I've talked to Mike about this before and, and, you know, we, we kind of met through the Jake and Gino wheelbarrow profits Academy. And, you know, it was one of those things that's kind of a catalyst where we met you guys and, and use you as our examples of how to do it. And we've been learning from you and, you know, it's, it's, right along with the book. You know, I, I really related to the book and I wanted to share it with anybody and everybody that I've talked to. <laughs> Thank so, you. We appreciate that. Yeah. You know, you've been a big part of our success and, and, you know, that's take that opportunity. So, um, now with, uh, with the, the worker bee versus the hive owner, um, you know, that's, that's the part that, that I really related to as far as, you know, I realized I was a worker bee because you, you said that they basically have enough honey and they just keep making honey. They just don't know why, because that's instinctual for them. And hey, go to school, get a job, you know, yep. go to college and then get out and, and pump that nine to five, throw it in the 401k and everything's gonna be fine. Yeah. And that's what we've all been taught. So that's, that's one of those things where this needs to be taught in school, to be quite honest with you, because they, they, the kids coming up today, and this is what I've taught my children. I've actually bought both of my kids a copy of it and sent it to them and in their, they're out of the house now. Um, and it's one of those things where I just definitely want them to read it so they understand the principles behind it so they can look for their multiple streams of income. Thank you. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, because I think that's why it's it's so important that this framework is is out there because I think people have this this stuck feeling and they don't know where to start. So you, you ha talk about this concept of find your surplus and that's kind of the beginning point of, of getting unstuck, right? And I think what was cool about this is it wasn't necessarily just about money. Um, it was about time. It was about, you know, whatever surplus you have, find that and exploit it. Um, so can you guys elaborate on that and maybe um, kind of how you guys did that in your journey of, of kind of finding your surplus and, and leveraging that for your, your goals? So for me, it was the surplus was I had an abundance of energy and I just knew what, what I wanted. Uh, and that was just focusing on multifamily. And um, when I, when I started, I had the education so that my surplus was, I knew how to under, underwrite deals. I knew how to uh, finance these deals. And I just knew, what I wanted to do. And that was my focus. And the surplus came once we started buying these assets, I was talking to Jake about refi and roll and using owner financing to get into more of these deals. And that was part of the surplus. And then once we just started buying these, these units within a year, we had 200 units and we had already started, let's start a podcast. Let's start showing people how to do this stuff. And the most important thing, when you start a podcast, you start an educational platform, you really learn how to do it. It's all about learning doing and then you ultimately start teaching it and when you become a teacher of anything you become really good because all of a sudden you start educating yourself you start really researching you start interviewing people who are amazing who can teach you so for me that was the catalyst to it and that's why ultimately starting jake and gino is great it's another stream of revenue but it also feeds and helps every single one of our other streams 
Yeah, and I'll elaborate on that a little bit as well, because obviously we're in the multifamily space, <laughs> but say you own a fitness center and you're you know, paying rent to the landlord. It's, it's really interesting if you look at that and say, how can this person find their surplus? Maybe they're a personal trainer and they own the, the gym as well, um, but they're renting. So think about it. Okay, what, what, what if I went out and I purchased a mixed-use building, put my fitness center in there, rented out a few of the units, and then maybe from there, uh, I you know, start to build out multiple streams of revenue from within the fitness center. You know, uh, there's businesses that we can do in there. Maybe we can do a, a juice bar with some protein shakes in the front. Maybe we can expand upon the personal training that's going on there. Uh, maybe we'll have some fitness classes in the back because now we have a bigger space and we're able to do that. And then, hey, there's people that are really enjoying this unique service that we're offering from the personal training perspective. Maybe we'll put that out there online in, in some sort of uh, online education to really expand our reach. Now we're building up some online presence. We have some media going and, and we realize that people really like our protein bottle and we, that we do it in a little bit different of a way. We, the way it shakes up, it really crushes up the protein so it's, it's absorbed quicker. And then we can start marketing that in, you know, in addition to our online platform. So it's just, it's finding something that you're already good at and maybe it's your, your core business and then expanding around that to create these multiple streams because there's gonna be times where one's up, one's down and then you'll have to go and pull some levers and tweak it. But you're doing something you already have a good uh, base, a base knowledge around that you can expand upon. If you're in the fitness center, then you say, hey, we're going to go do Bitcoin next week because I was at the bar and this guy mentioned it to me and I thought that sounded really cool. Well, that knowledge base doesn't already exist. So that's where, you know, you're going to run into those situations where you can get burned. And I know Gino can talk about Maserati Mike and, and some of those issues there that we've, uh, we've shared with folks before. But that's, that's what we're saying. If you stay in your lane and, and you look for your surplus and focus on that core business, there's a lot of opportunities that you may not even be considering. And Jake, let's expand upon that. What about nutrition? What about supplements for that business? What about creating day trips? Or, or hey, you want to talk about making money, getting the supplements, Europe, right? Right. <laughs> that's right. Let's talk about food. Non-regulated. Let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about meal prep. I mean, there, it's it, you can explode from one little brick and mortar store. You can have an amazing array, and the key is you don't have to do it all by yourself. You can bring on partners to help you out. And you know, real estate and any business owner, any entrepreneur knows that leverage is the most powerful thing you can have. Not only leverage of money, but leveraging other people's skills by paying them and by leveraging partnerships. So it's important. You don't have to have the I'm a mentality where I'm doing everything. We stay in our lanes. Jake does a lot of the property management. I do a lot of the education, but we do a lot of crossover. We work together on Rand Cares. We work Rand together on the Rand family of companies, we couldn't do this alone. But we started out, and like Jake said, that simple thing with the, with the uh, gym owner, you start out with the gym, and then from there, get really good at it, start building your base, and then from there, start thinking what really flows with it, and just start one little, one little stream. And in the book, it was called Tributary Acres, where Tom lives. He had one little stream, and then all of a sudden, Noah noticed those multiple small little streams, they all begin to feed into a big river, and that river starts raging. Yeah. And guys, one, one quick note too. If you don't have your core yet and you don't know how to find your surplus, do some time and, and spend you know, time researching the right vehicle. I think that's the most important thing. If you're, if you're already not down the line and you're not committed to something, spend a lot of time researching what vehicle you want to be in and why. I think that's going to be the most important thing because if you can latch onto that vehicle, you can take the long view and say, Hey, I don't care if this takes five, 10 years to figure it out. I'm committed to it. And, and then you just put all your focus and attention behind that and don't deviate. Yeah. This, yeah. The synergy um, aspect of it. Well, like you said, finding the, the different areas of real estate, the property management and the, the basically anything that goes along with doing the multifamily real estate, it, it creates that synergy. And I, that was another concept that was phenomenal. So, yeah, from a knowledge perspective, you're not starting at ground zero every time you see a shiny object and you go and chase it. You can, you kind of building on that, that your experiences that you've, you've already had right in your core business. So yeah, that's really, why the vehicle is so important. That's what I'm saying. If you're not already, you know, down the line and you have three restaurants or, you know, you have a, a series of, laundromats or whatever the, the thing is. If, if you're starting from scratch or you're in the beginning and you're just trying to create a life of abundance for yourself, you have a great opportunity to latch onto the right vehicle and time is on your side. So I think that's, that's an important uh, point. 
Cool. Um, out of all those principles, guys, is there, is there a favorite one of yours that, uh, the, I guess, out of these business basic money principles that are, are taught throughout this book and the one that you guys find most important or, or kind of latch on to? I have two. I have first one is transactions don't create wealth. Equity does. I think that's an important one. And for me, the revelation to become a true entrepreneur is don't ask, don't ask how, ask who. And that was so hard for me because during the restaurant time, I never asked that question. I would always ask, how am I going to do the job? How am I going to get the catering? How am I going to work 12 hours today? Not who can help me out or you know, who is right for this job. And Noah came up against that. He's trying to scale out his portfolio and he sees that he doesn't have any time. So Tom tells him, don't ask how, ask who can help you. Noah ends up hiring a property management company. And then later down the road, as he's scaling up, he's figuring out, wow, I can take some of this in house now that I can start saving some money and I can start creating those multiple streams. In the beginning, it wasn't about creating those multiple streams. In the beginning, it was about really building out his business and trying to scale up his business. And then from there, after he had his business up and running and he was able to, he was able to take some of this in house and create those economies of scale and create those efficiencies. Jake, which that's one you- the- that's well, I want to touch on that a little bit more because that's the one point that we get asked so many questions about is that when do I hire? Because so many people are so tight fisted and they're living for the moment and living in, into to, like this moment right now. I got a mortgage payment. I got this. And it may, may, they, maybe they're not even tight fisted. They just really have that much of a carry cost behind them that they don't have the opportunity. But I think even for Gino and myself, and I'm, I'm very open about this, I think one of the biggest mistakes that we made early on was not hiring quicker. We probably waited too long in many instances uh, to hire the next position or or expand on. And look, we have nearly 60 employees right now. So it's not like you can't overcome these things. We're all going to make mistakes along the way. But it's that that mentality. And so many people are, when do I hire? What's the next position I should hire for? Look at the needs. Look at the needs that you have in front of you. For many people, if they're not going to start a property management company, a lot of times it's a personal assistant. And they're not willing to branch out and take on that personal assistant because they feel like I can just do it. I can just do it. <laughs> Guilty as charged right here. And I know Gino is what is as well. We, we talk about the I'm a mentality. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do everything. Guilty all the time. But we could have gone even further and faster than where we are now if we would have recruited more help on early because we tried to do too much. So Jake, I can give you a great story. Um, I'm, starting to, I'm starting to pay my children right now. And if this was five years ago, I would have called ADP. I would have set everything up. I would have given other things. And now (laughs) I didn't even think twice. I've got a bookkeeper who's going to do that for me for 35 bucks an hour. She's probably going to do a better job than me. No, she definitely is doing a better job. She'll do a better (laughs) job for me. That's for sure. (laughs) But it's, it's a very difficult thing. Five years ago, I would have said to Jake, Jake, send up those papers. Bring them up to me. Put them in an envelope every month. Bring them to the restaurant. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to sit down and do the QuickBooks, and I'm going to really save us some money and be efficient. And then those are soul-sucking opportunities. And I'll give you another one. And they're not efficient. That's the thing. You think you're being efficient. You're being a dummy. Yeah, and we started our podcast years ago. For the first three years, Jake decided to edit the podcast, put in show notes, and talk about a soul-sucking two and a half hours or three hours a week. (laughs) Every week he was doing it. And And I I, I was terrible at it. I was awful. (laughs) No, like for the first year, people were like, I can't even hear you guys. What did you say? I got to turn it up when when Jake speaks and turn it down when Gino speaks because we didn't know what we were doing. Larry, take notes, man. Take notes. So (laughs) what we ended up doing was we ended up hiring someone for 15 bucks an hour. They edited the podcast. They did the show notes. Did they charge us a little more? Probably. But you know what? I never heard Jake complain about any of those podcasts. His Thursday afternoons were liberated for two hours. And I think Jake's time is worth more than 15 bucks an hour. I would say it's worth a lot more than that. And not the only math, that, the math says so. <laughs> the math says so. And you know what? Your energy says so because you hate doing that, right? If that's you right. love to do that task and said, oh, I just find so much joy and pleasure in it, that's a different story. But that's dude, not the dude, case. Dude, garage band, man. I don't even know if I was in the right app. <laughs> Uh, you want to talk about a you want to talk about a, a shit show, man? Give me give me like doing tech work. So yeah, mine's Adobe Audible. <laughs> Not for long, Larry. No. Not for long. Nope, I, I, was up at, I was up at three a.m. making phone call or sending emails trying to find somebody to edit the podcast because a forty-eight year old should not be dealing with technology like this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny though because it comes back to that uh, I guess that scarcity mindset that we always talk about. Like we're just we're told to like save everything you can and put it in the bank account. 
because you'll need it one day. But really, you got to spend some of those resources. Also, to get guilt, where you're going. guilt is involved as well. You start feeling yeah. guilty, like, uh, oh man, I could be saving this like fifty cents here and fifty. Yeah. You got to be. You you just got to like start thinking bigger than that and know where you're going. I think that's the biggest thing. And have and, and look, I don't want to get too football on you guys, but trust the process. All right. <laughs> Everyone needs to read the book "Killing Sacred Cows" by Garrett Gunderson because they talk about the abundance mindset versus the scarcity mindset. Now, I don't hate on saving for retirement. But the problem is when most people save for retirement, it's an inefficient way to do it. You're putting two, three, $4 million into a retirement account that you can't touch until you're 59 and a half years old. And then you have to pull it out at 70 years old at 70 and a half, even if you get yourself into a higher tax bracket, even if you don't need it, your tax dollar for dollar, your deferred savings. But at, when you're at the end of the rainbow, they're taxing you dollar for dollar. Taxes are going up. That's an inefficient way. And the other problem is you've been trained from a scarcity mindset. You're saving for that rainy day. Well, what happens when you become 65 years old? You're not, you don't want to touch the principal. So you have $3 million sitting in a bank account, but you're only willing to pull out $50,000 a year. So it's all about your mindset. It's all about not enjoying it. Money is there to be utilized. It's only a tool. It's meant there to be invested, to be saved, to be spent. I have the three-step framework, Jake. Save, invest, and donate. That's what money is all about. And if you can't do that and you're just saving for a rainy day, those rainy days are going to come up. And then when, you, when you're when you there, you can't even enjoy it. So it's about abundance. It's about scarcity. And it's about, not, in Garrett Gunderson's book, it's about finding your sole purpose, ultimately. Let the cash flow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the honeybee is about feeling trapped in your job and creating the multiple streams of income. Um, basically what you had said, you, you should start and find your core, your core business and then mm -hmm. take it from there. Is, is there any other advice that you would have to people that are starting to begin at the beginning of their multiple streams of income journey? No, I mean, I, I think it's pretty clear as what we were talking about before with a vehicle. I think that if you put the, the time in yourself and I think the, the idea is educating yourself in the beginning and find out, what vehicle you want to be in and what vehicle you want to be a part of so you can create those streams around that vehicle because every business has it. I think it's just finding out what's important to you and what vehicle you want to latch on to. I think that's the key and then not deviating. And, and that's the hard part though. So I think the easy part would be taking a few months, investing in yourself, you know, reading everything you can get your hands on and getting very comfortable in the vehicle. The hard part is it's going to seem like a pie in the sky. I don't care what it is. You know, unless you want to just invest in stocks or something boring like that. But it, I mean, once you find that vehicle and you really want to be an entrepreneur, invest and, and create something, I'm telling you, the limiting beliefs are going to start coming out from everywhere. They're going to come from your parents. They're going to come from Aunt Susie. Your, your, your wife's going to call you a loser. What the hell are you thinking? Like, whatever it is, it's going to come from like, come, we were talking about, you know, where I grew up in Western New York is a very small town. There was a, a, a chair factory there and everyone worked at the central school district and there was multiple police stations. So very few entrepreneurs. So in, in my mind, my limiting belief, I share this with Gino all the time is, I'm not, a, I can't be a business owner because I have no exposure to it. It's just not there. It's not something that I was exposed to. So I think the, the key is, look, all this stuff that we see and Steve Jobs said it a million times, it was created by people that are no, no smarter than us. So get that, you know, get that first and foremost, you can do whatever you want to do. If you put the time in and you have the energy to do it from there though, it's like finding what are you going to do? What vehicle are you going to latch onto? And then go from there. Uh, and, and again, invest in yourself because it's going to be your most you know, valuable investment in the long run. So let, to let me bookend what Jake said is the first thing is the clarity. Really get clarity in your situation. Mm -hmm. I want multifamily for the multiple reasons. We can discuss the principal pay down, the tenants paying your mortgage, the cost segregation benefits, the cash flow, the appreciation, the fact that it's food, clothing, and what else, Jake, the three needs? It's, it's apartments and it's do you, you know, because <laughs> right. it, it, like we, we like apartments, but at the end of the day, latch on to what's important to you and what's going to align with your values. We're not here to push, you know, apartments, but I think that the most important thing is that you're in the right vehicle for you. And, and that's, that's right. Sense so that. to finish that, the clarity, and yep. then it's education times action equals results because you can take massive action like I did when I first started my career and have really disastrous results that you can go back and get the education and join a community, join a group, get mentored, pay to play or seek to serve. Pick one of those two. You're going to dramatically shorten your learning curve and that education times action will ultimately equal your results. Yeah. And I just to piggyback off that, I think that's the, that will get you into the game. That's essentially the formula that got Gino and I into the multifamily game. 
But then, then you're going to have these inflection points where it pivots because once you get into the game and you have employees from there, it's about people, systems, and culture. And I think that really will apply to almost any business. And what I mean by that is some people try to create the system and say, I can put any employee into it. I'm not a believer in that because I haven't experienced it in my life. Maybe it's the case. I'd rather have a robot than an employee like that though. So I think it's, it's finding great people to work with, having the systems in place that they can execute their duties. And it's on you as the leader to create that culture that people want to be a part of, can latch onto and have a vision and see that they want to be a part of that community because it's, it's basically pushing them to do something bigger than themselves. And it's, it's in a higher mission than just the, you know, the numbers at the end of the day. Yeah, having that vision is key. And, and Gino, to, to piggyback on what you said, that knowledge plus action, right? Because I think you hear a lot of times knowledge is power, but reality knowledge is nothing if you don't do anything with it. And you guys have said that, you know, in multiple, I've heard you in multiple different podcasts mention that, and it's, it's so true. You can learn everything you, there is to know about something, but if you don't do something with it, you're still- Yeah, you get off the sidelines. We're drowning yeah. in knowledge and information. We are drowning in it. And it, you might get confused. And I think the clarity is, okay, what do I do with this information? And the reason you know, why I'm on this podcast with Jake is I'm his partner and he's my partner. And, and that partnership, that accountability piece, really helped us out to take action together because we were both pretty smart, but maybe uh, maybe by ourselves, we wouldn't have become as successful as we are. So that's another show and another, another instance with partnerships, but it's really important that if you can find an accountability person to really push you, like I'm pushing you, Mike, you're, you're, you're calling that broker and you're going to give me an answer on Monday to know if that deal is going through or not. Gino's through. breaking them down before <laughs> Better the show. Believe it. Like, Mike, I want a phone call on Monday, brother. <laughs> but it's, it's really important, isn't it? Because if, if, yeah. if you have nobody there, you're not letting me down. You may let yourself down, but you're not going to let your partner down. And Jake talks about it all the time. That motivation can come from within. Me and Jake are self-motivated. But sometimes if you know, you're having a rough day. You look within and who are you serving? I'm serving the Jake and Gino team. I'm serving my family. I'm serving Jake's family too. So Gino, I'm, what, what ET say at uh, multifamily mastery three so, about, the, about your parents? Uh, it, yeah, uh, that was powerful. Larry knows. I know not on my watch. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then right. it was, no, but it was great because he's like, look at the end of the day, um, you know, who's important to you. And so when you, when you're reflecting and looking back and saying, why am I doing this? And because we, we talk about it all the time, real estate is a full contact sport and you got to know why you're in it. And for myself, I got, I got two little kids out there that mean the world to me. I got my wife and I'm going to go to bat and I'm going to go to war every day for them to create the life that I want them to have. And that's, you know, every day I'm getting up and, and going to war for that. And look, that's, that's the mentality. That's how I might get myself hyped up, but that there's so much truth to that. And that's so real that how, how am I not going to perform? Uh, and like, being stuck in that W-2 me. job for you, Jake, being stuck in that W-2 job and now fulfilling your oh, potential crushing is probably killing you because you know you can do better for your wife. And that's the same thing with me at the restaurant, stuck back in the kitchen, knowing that I can do better, that I can give them a better life and knowing that I'm just coasting and I'm just comfortable. Life is not about being comfortable. When we're dead, we can be as comfortable as we want. We're alive right now. We have to push ourselves out of that's our comfort zone. That's where the party zone, is, bro. Yeah. guys. That's where the party is. When you push yourself outside your comfort zone, when you stretch yourself – that's when you're living. That's where the party begins. And then you keep pushing from there. I'm telling you the, the amazing things that you think you could never do operate in that zone. And I challenge everybody out there listening, put yourself out there, expose yourself. It's the man in the arena, right? It was that Teddy Roosevelt, the, the quote from <laughs> yeah, Jennifer, you yeah. got to put yourself in the game because if you don't, you're going to have a life of regret. Awesome. Cool. I got one more last question on the, on the honeybee guys. Is Tom, is that uh, based off a, a mentor or inspiration in your, in your guys' journey? I don't know, Gina. Who's Tom? You know, for me, Tom is the all wise, all knowing. <laughs> Tom's gone. <laughs> I, I, I want to. I want to be Tom. Do you know why? Because I want to be that unassuming person when somebody looks at me and goes, wow, he's worth $100 million. You wouldn't know. I'm out there. That's why I created Jake and Gino. I want to be a Tom who's sharing my knowledge. So for me, hopefully I can grow into a Tom where I can share my knowledge with my students and let them grow and give them these little tips and, and be a mentor to them. That's what I was thinking. Gino about. is a living Tom. He's the most humble guy in the world. And if you look at the book and you look at our success, it's education times action equals results. You know, I was a little bit younger than the GDA at the time. So I came out of the box, out of the gate, screaming with a ton of energy. But listen, listen. Everything I learned on multifamily was from the G-Dad. So he was, he's been my mentor from the beginning and he's mentored thousands of people since then. And that's why we're proud to say, you know, the Jake and Gino community students have closed over 5,000 units. 
And, and it really does look, you, you're not, you're not going to just know this stuff. And we talked about, you know, the financial institutions and, and making things confusing. It's, it's the buy right, manage right, and finance right. And you, you just don't wake up one day knowing this stuff. So it, the, the mentor piece of it is huge. And I know the G dad is super you know, humble over there. So he's not going to say it, but uh, the G dad, that's my Tom right there. I'll be, I'll be your Huckleberry brother. <laughs> Um, yeah, we met, uh, Mike and I met through an accountability pod from your, your wheelbarrow profits Academy. And I got to tell you that, uh, Gino's my Tom as well. <laughs> Thank you. And now that accountability pod that just rings my ears because we're all about masterminds, right? We're all yeah. like getting together and just sharing knowledge and holding each other accountable getting on the calls every month. What did you do? what's going on, those opportunities that flow. You're able to teach Larry, somebody about seller financing. Someone has no idea on how to buy right. It's just, we put them together and magic is made. So I got, a, I got an idea, guys. What do you think about this? Just a, uh, you know, it can be maybe a black shirt with white lettering and it's only for the G dad and it says, I'll be your Tom. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think that's good, right? You guys like that? <laughs> Absolutely. I like that. <laughs> we'll, we'll start uh, production tomorrow. <laughs> I like it. I like that. <laughs> I do like that. That is good. So, um, when, when you guys were writing the book, um, you drew out from, you drew from your own experiences. Now for the people out there that are just starting out, uh, one of the questions that I've, I've been asked a lot is would I recommend that they start small with the one to four units, or do you think they should use the, the Grant Cardone methodology of go big or go home? <laughs> I would actually say that you really, the first thing I've said it again, you really need to be educated. The, the other thing I would say is, what is your situation? If you're a 20 something year old who just got out of college, maybe that one to four is great where you house hack and you jump into it and you, you can pay all your bills. You can quote unquote, become financially free at a young age where all of your bills are paid. That may be the route. Choose and select what, what's right for you. I would tell all our students, and this is what we told our students this weekend, it doesn't matter the size of the deal that you buy, especially in this market. It really matters on the quality of the deal. One deal that Jake and I just sold, we sold an eight unit deal that we had bought three and a half years ago. It was an afterthought. We bought it for 37,000 a unit. We sold it for 103,000 a unit, eight oh. units. That one deal, I made more money in that one deal than I would have done if I worked two years at the restaurant. So I'm just saying it doesn't matter the size of the deal. I would try to buy everything. And it's all about that first deal. You don't want to take anything on that's super risky that you don't know what you're doing. The important thing about that first deal is it will create momentum. That's the first thing. It will create credibility. And you all of a sudden, the brokers see that you're a closer. And then all of a sudden, you have proof of concept. So if you're hearing the Grant Cardone, go big or go home, and you're saying to yourself, I need to do 100 units, but you can't really fathom the 100 units because like Jake said before, it's pie in the sky. Life coaching and, and, and personal development will tell you you'll never be able to hit that because it's a goal that's unattainable that you can't think and fathom for yourself. Now, if you're with partners and others and you're able to raise money and you're able to have somebody on your team who has experience, go ahead. Like for Jake and I, we started at 25 units because I had some experience. I sort of had some education. So 25 units for our first deal was beautiful. It was sweet. We had some owner financing. My brother partnered with us. So we were able to take that 25 units down. Um, and that's how we started. So Jake, if you want to con continue. No, on I that. like little deals in the beginning because little deals lead to little mistakes. And when you start off with a huge deal, um, which is going to be harder to do anyways, if you have zero credibility. So that's the other thing. If you can build up a portfolio of some smaller assets, it's going to allow you to scale up into the bigger assets. And I, and I think that a lot of you know what Grant says is to get people motivated to go out there because I think it is massive action, but massive action may mean a 10 unit deal. Because look, if you started with nothing and you get into it, that may be massive action. But from there, you know, continue to scale and take what the market gives you. We really believe in doing solid deals. Don't get frustrated because you see, you know, Joe Blow just closed 500 units, you know, and then the next week he closed 300. Great. You know, let him go out and you know, syndicate those deals and that's fine. Work on doing really good deals regardless. And, and hopefully you can go out and find a 500 unit deal that, that just is banging and you love it. I think the key is though, don't get into a position where you're forcing deals because you're getting caught up in like the social media and all the, the buzz stuff that's out there. I think having a, a good track record for a long term and building up, it's, it's building a portfolio for the long term. Look, real estate is a long game. Okay. You're not going to make money. Like you're not going to crush it in year one and all of a sudden you're a millionaire. It's going to take three to five years to really get the, the snowball built up. So I think that stringing together a series of good deals, regardless of the size, uh, is, is my preference. Look, that's our story. That's what we've done. 
but uh, I, I'd rather see somebody, you know, start with something that they're comfortable with because they're going to basically have proof of concept and iron out those kinks early on versus just throwing something out there that they could potentially get creamed on. And you don't want to be a one and done. And right, you don't want to go out there and, and get, you know, creamed on your first one. Either. The exciting thing about multifamily is we both started it and we had part-time and we were doing, we had mm -hmm. our full-time jobs and we were doing a part-time because when you buy 25 units all in one location, you go collect the rents twice a week. You're, you're there in the property. You're not scattered. It's so much easier to start with multifamily because you can start part-time and there'll become that inflection point. When do I quit my job? That's the best kind of problem to have because you're not sure when to do it when you're about 80 75 to 80 percent of when you think it's almost like an employee if you're already thinking about when am i supposed to hire that's probably when you're going to hire yeah. when you're thinking about when should i leave my job you're probably ready to leave your job so from what i've been hearing between larry and mike i think larry's <laughs> on the precipice right now we're gonna have to push larry off a little bit but it, it's true you you have those inflection points Gino, check this out while you're in the background you're paying down the mortgage so you're building equity as you're going with these units but you're also building confidence. If you're doing a 10 or a 25 unit, yes. you're realizing that, look, it's not rocket science and there's not a whole lot that's different with the 10 unit versus the 150 unit. So I think that confidence though is going to give you the ability to just operate better as well. So you may not need it, but if you do, it's not a bad thing. And if you bought an awesome 10 or 20 or 30 unit deal, what's wrong with that? There's plenty of people that are overpaying for 300 unit complexes right now. So kudos to you if you find some of the cash flows. Nice. You guys talk a lot about um, in your journey, like this grit of like, you regard, you're not going to get immediate success and you're not going to go out and learn real estate in a day and, and be buying properties tomorrow. But what, how do you balance that? You know, I've been doing it for 12 months, been doing it for 18 months and I still haven't got something. Do I keep my nose to the grindstone or do I need to switch up my approach and switch up my strategy or, you know, pick a different game? And, I, and the reason I ask that is because I know a lot of people in this like 10 to 50 to 60 unit property um, are starting to ask the question, um, do I just go back to duplexes and single family because I can't break into this? And what well, do you guys say to that? Remember, real estate is all about the three pillars. I mean, it's really market cycle, it's debt, and it's exit strategy. I think everyone needs to write that down. It's market cycle, debt, and exit strategy. And the part of the market cycle we are right now, maybe it's hot. It is a long game. It's really all about building relationships with brokers. It's really about building relationships with bankers. It's really about building relationships with investors. And it's going to take a little while, a little bit of time, but I will guarantee you, once you find that first deal, we found our first deal. Three months later, we closed on our second deal. Six months later, we closed on our third deal. And we, per, we got bigger. It was 25 units, then 36 units, then 136 units. And it was all broker-driven. We had those relationships created. We were closers. So it might take you 12 months, 18 months. Even if it takes you two years to find your first deal, don't you think you want that kind of success, even waiting two years to do something like that? So for, for everyone out there, have a strong enough why. That's the important thing, like Jake was saying. If your why is strong enough, you're going to figure out how to do it. And you don't have to quit your job day one. You can do it as a side hustle, spending five, six, eight, ten 10 hours a week. We had a podcast today with a Chad King with a student of ours. He was make it happen. He has a wholesaling business full time, doing property tours and underwriting deals on the weekends at nighttime. He knows what his why is. He's not watching football on the weekends. He's not watching TV. He's super focused on what he wants. As long as you know what your why is, when you come through those little pitfalls and those little you know, bumps in the road, you can still figure out and say, I still want to do this because I have a desire and I have that vision. And I would just add on to that, look in the mirror because there's a lot of other people out there doing deals right now. And I'm telling you, look, it's never going to be the right time. It's never going to be the perfect moment. It's up to you and it's up to like how bad you want it. And I'm not saying go out and overpay, but look in the mirror. If you're saying I'm, I'm in it for 12 months and it's just too hard, you're right. If you're looking in the mirror saying, I'm going to figure this point. shit out and get it done, you're right. <laughs> That's such a good point because two years ago, two and a half years ago with Chris Jackson, one of our coaches, I'd get on these powwow calls. I just met him and we were both complaining about, there's no deals in the market. I'm in Jacksonville. He's in Atlanta. This is Mar March of 2016 and 17. We were complaining back then. And now our coach Chris is crushing it, closing deals. And they're more expensive, a lot more expensive than they were three years ago. What changed? this change. He got more educated. He got more knowledge and he ha he got the framework on how to do these deals. So when you're out there saying that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, as Jake says, there are many deals out there. You just have to know what to look for in a deal, where the value is in the deal. And you have to find out who has those deals for sale. Yeah. And I'll throw it out there right now. We just changed up our entire syndication business to open up more deals. And essentially what we're going to be doing is paying back dollar for dollar. Everything that comes through, every net gain on our properties is going to be returned back to the investors until all the equities returned. 
there's, there's no, you know, there's, there's no split at that point. There's nothing coming back to us except the asset management fee because it, we think it's going to make us more competitive and it, it actually aligns values and it aligns interests and we feel great about it. So there's always something that can be done to make you more competitive and more attractive and you can always out hustle. At the end of the day, you can always out hustle the next guy if you're up to it. Awesome. Cool. Very good. Very good. Um, well, what, what we want to do is kind of do a little bit of an overview of, of your different branches of the, of your, your businesses, you know, the, the wheelbarrow profits group, ran cares, ran capital, um, and, and just talk about a little bit of the synergy, how, how it's blown up since you started doing the synergy and then, you know, just kind of give us an overview of your empire. Jake he said, he said empire, Gino. Empire. So look, it, it, it all, it all started <laughs> up front with, with knowing the vehicle. We started wanting to own assets because as Gino said earlier, it's food, clothing, and apartments and the demographics back it up. So we found out that this was the vehicle we wanted to be in. We latched onto the vehicle and we started building from there. I did not want to, you know, have someone managing these assets because it's the buy right, manage right and finance right. And we thought, okay, we can go in and buy these things, but look at a 25 unit, Who's going to manage it in Maryville, Tennessee was our first asset. We didn't know. So no, who's better than the person that owns it to get in there and figure it out. I'm not going to say we we're as efficient or as good as we should have been from the beginning, but it allowed us to develop systems and processes and figure it out. And from there, we were able to scale our management business because what it's all about for us now is customer service and quality of service to all the residents. So now we're able to build something out where we're delivering on what I call our blue ocean. I think that's the place where we're going to separate ourselves in the multifamily space from the management perspective is by having that blue ocean strategy of based around customer service, because time and time again, you know, you go in you see the reviews on an apartment complex you're trying to buy. If you're over four, typically those are fake reviews. Okay. That's fake news. All right, man. <laughs> so, I mean, you, you just see it though. And you know, because it's like, Oh, what a great place to live. You know, Susie Q from Nebraska. Okay. And it's just, it's very easy to find out what's going on quickly. So we, we started building from the ground up with the management from there, you know, I uh, said, you know, Gino, I don't know who said it. Gino, let's write a book. I said, right. Who, whoever said it, we decided to write a book. We just started to write the podcast about the same time. And that started this little media arm uh, unintentionally of Jake and Gino. We just wanted to get the message out there and that expanded into the education. The cool thing about that is we had the podcast going, we're learning from great syndicators out there and we're saying to ourselves, what if a $30 million deal comes our way? What if a $50 million deal comes our way? We're not going to be able to take that down internally because remember the first thousand apartments that we bought, Gino and I bought them ourselves. We didn't syndicate those deals. We used a strategy that you can see uh, find in Wheelbarrow Profits called Refine Roll. So from that point, we're learning about the syndication space and we say, okay, let's give it a shot. We brought on a partner. Remember what Gino said earlier? It's about finding the who, okay? So we found the who, we brought a partner on, we started doing that. From that point, we're having a lot of students come in saying, hey, we wanna know how to finance these deals. We got great relationships with dust lenders and agency lenders and community banks. We decided to start Rand Capital. I remember what I said before, people, systems, and culture. Look, Gino's always been a charitable guy. I'm a little bit younger. I was a little bit behind the curve. I, I would ride the coattails of the corporate you know, donations and things, but I never really started anything from a charitable sense. What we found is that our employees wanted it. Our employees were asking for it. And so I led the charge by saying, look, if you're an adult, you know, you're on your own, but I want to make sure the kids are taken care of. So we started feeding kids at Thanksgiving. We started building playgrounds locally in Tennessee. We uh, were doing things for when employees have fallen hardships. We're doing, you know, GoFundMe pages. We just raised $8,000 for one of our employees. Uh, Gino's down in, you know, uh, Harlem with the Friars feeding people every year. So it's just the Rand Cares piece is really all about culture and, and it's about, you know, making, you know, others lives better than ours and, and trying to, you know, you just spread the abundance mentality. So that's, you know, a, a kind of a brief overview of how this, you know, uh, vertically integrated organization transpired. Larry, picture this. It's 2015. I'm sitting in the library in New York. It's cold. I get a phone call from Jake. I'm doing work because I don't have an office at the time. I'm, I'm, I'm This is my side hustle. And Jake's like, I found this $55 million deal. I think we're going to put an offer on it. And I felt like throwing up as he's telling me. <laughs> and I had said, how do we do that? 
<laughs> and it's all about, that's how the syndication arm came about. It's all about pushing yourself. So I sit there and I had no idea. And Jake is like, let's not worry about how let's worry about who, and let's worry about learning the space. And just from that one conversation that sparked the idea to start the syndication company and to become educated more on syndication, we use the platform of the podcast to syndicate 15, 20 top syndicators, whether it was, um, we had, you know, you mentioned them all. We had Vinny Tropro, Michael Blank, Mark Kenny, uh, Dave Zook. The list goes on and on. Everyone had their own unique little style, but we picked an, a part. Each one of them were able to speak to them. So from that one fortuitous phone call that we had that we probably knew we weren't going to get the deal, but just thinking outside the box and saying, how do we do this? And let's learn this. And this may be an opportunity down the road. You know, fast forward, we didn't get that deal. It yeah. was a little bit too expensive, but that's not the point. The point is that we thought really big. We got really scared. If your goals are, don't scare you at least a little bit, then they're not really, they're not really goals. They're not challenging you. So the, the point of that conversation, the point of that story really is to think outside the box. And that's how the syndication arm began because it's like, we need to do this. I want to get bigger. And this is one of the ways to get bigger. Syndication was a tool in the toolbox. And I said, let's learn how to utilize it. Again, Gino, it's not rocket science. Syndication, it was all about who? It was about finding mm -hmm. the right partner, you know, to go out and help raise the money and then having the right syndication attorney. It's mm -hmm. really not. I mean, people will overcomplicate it, but you get on a call with, uh, we use Kim Taylor. Uh, you get on a call with Kim. She'll break it down for you pretty easily. And uh, you start to say, oh, okay, we're going to do a 70-30 split, you know, 3%, you know, acquisition fee, yada, yada, yada. It's, you know, you want to comply, you want to make sure you're doing everything by the, you know, to the letter of the law, but it's, it's about having the right partners on the team to execute. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. It's really, it's really impressive that you guys have <clears throat> taken that one core business and then just expanded it into multiple different arms and not just from the business perspective, but Jake, like you mentioned, the Rand cares and how you really, um, you really make an impact in that community down there that you guys operate in. So awesome. Really, uh, really impressive guys. So um, other than that, uh, Larry, any last, uh, last questions here, man? Um, no, I think, you know, th these guys have been a fantastic guests and, and you've helped us through our careers and, you know, and just wanted to say, take the opportunity to say thank you again and, and, uh, see if we can find out, uh, where we can find out more about you guys and where the, the listeners can get involved with your, your businesses you, you, you go down to st augustine and, and uh, hang out with the g daddy down there by the cathedral 75 right? degrees take, in january that's take right a walk on the beach man hey i'll take that we got 12 inches of snow right now. i'll it's, be in that area next week it's real easy it's jake and gino.com if you want to do jake and gino.com forward slash honeybee you'll go on that page we have a few videos there's some resources on there if you want to apply to work with us apply for our mentorship you can do that there's a link for the book there Click on that link. You can get it on Kindle. You can get the hard, the hard copy sent over to you. We're at, in the process of recording an audible. The audio should be coming out within the next month or so. Just go on there. And, and, the, and the audible is amazing because the G dad read it in studio in, uh, was it Jacksonville, right? We were in Jacksonville for a couple of days. Yeah. And then we did a, uh, a series of interview questions at the end of each chapter. So Next level stuff with, with the G dad on that one. Very, it was a lot very of fun. Good. It was a good project. Was good. Wasn't yeah. it? Never so, been in I mean, studio before. I loved it. Yeah, it was, it, it's another, it's another get uncomfortable, right? You start reading a book that is no, uncomfortable. Studio was comfortable, man. Studio was zen. No. You had like the little smelly goods going and the lights were down. Really comfy <laughs> yeah, but couches. bro, isn't it funny? Listen, like Dr. Voice? Dre. <laughs> <laughs> that was good. So Jake and Gina.com forward slash honeybee. Go check it out, everybody. Awesome. Like, yeah. like I said in the beginning, fantastic book, guys. I, I think anybody who can should buy a crate of these and dish them off to uh, anybody who needs a little guidance in their life because this is, like I said, you distilled these really, really important principles so easy to, to grasp in this book. So thank you guys for writing and thanks for taking the time to, uh, to jump on the show today. Thanks, thanks everybody. Take care. Take care. Perfect. Let us know when this thing goes.